In this lesson, we will discuss monodromy. First, we'll review some concepts involving Riemann surfaces. Recall the following definitions. Suppose that S with the set U sub alpha, U sub alpha for alpha and I is a compact connected Riemann surface. We say that a subset U and S is open in S if U sub alpha of U intersected with U sub alpha is open in C for all alpha and I. We say that U, assume that U in S is open in S. Then we say that a well-defined map F from U to P1 of C is called holomorphic on U if F composed with mu sub alpha inverse from mu sub alpha of U intersect U sub alpha to C satisfies the cauchy riemann equations. These say that the partial derivative of u with respect to x equals the partial derivative of v with respect to y, and the partial derivative of u with respect to y equals minus the partial derivative of v with respect to x, where f composed with mu sub alpha inverse of x plus i y is written in the form u of x y plus i times v of x y. We denote the collection of all holomorphic functions on U by O of U. Then we say that a well-defined map beta from S to P1 of C is called a meromorphic function if for each P in S there is an open set U in S containing P such that the restriction of beta to U equals F over G for some holomorphic functions F and G from U to P1 of C. We'll denote by k of s those meromorphic beta from s to p1 of c. The subset o sub p in k of s will denote those meromorphic functions satisfying that beta restricted to u equals f over g, with g of p is not equal to zero, and m sub p in o sub p as those meromorphic functions satisfying f of p equals zero. Consider the following proposition. O of U is a commutative ring, and O of S is isomorphic to C, the constant function. Next, K of S is a field. O sub P is a commutative ring contained in this field, and M sub P is the unique maximal ideal contained in this ring. Next, consider the following definitions. Suppose that S1 and S2 are two compact connected Riemann surfaces. We'll use the charts U sub alpha, mu sub alpha with alpha in I for S1 and denote the charts for S sub 2 as V sub beta, eta sub beta for beta in J. We say that a well-defined map V from S1 to S2 is called a morphism if F composed with C from S1 to P1 of C is a holomorphic map for each holomorphic map F from S2 to P1 of C. We say that a well-defined map V from S1 to S2 is biholomorphic if C is a bijective holomorphic map. That is, for each Q in S2, there exists a unique P in S1 such that Q equals C of P. Suppose that S equals S1 equals S2. A biholomorphism phi from S to itself is called an automorphism. We'll denote the collection of all automorphisms by O of S. This is a group under composition. In this case, the composition mu sub beta composed phi composed mu sub alpha inverse from mu sub alpha of phi inverse of B sub beta intersected with U sub alpha to C has a non-vanishing derivative, so that it is a conformal map. Next, we'll consider the following theorem proved by Felix Klein in 1888 and Leon Greenberg in 1963. Assume that the genus of S is zero. The finite subgroups of S isomorphic to PSL2C are the cyclic group of order N, the dihedral group of order 2N, a4, S4, and A5. 
Next, assume that the genus of S is one. The finite subgroups of odd of S, isomorphic to R mod Z, cross R mod Z, semi-direct product one over N Z mod Z, are the cyclic group of order M cross the cyclic group of order N, semi-direct product with the cyclic group of order K, for K dividing six. Next, assume that the genus of S is greater than or equal to two. Then S is in the form H star mod gamma for some Fuchsian group gamma in PSL2R. Its automorphism group odd of S contains the normalizer of gamma mod gamma and is finite with the size of the automorphism group of S is less than or equal to 84 times the quantity G of S minus one. Finally, every finite group G appears as the automorphism group of S for some Riemann surface S. Next, we'll look at branched covers of Riemann surfaces. Fix a non-constant morphism phi from S1 to S2. For each P in S1, we'll denote Q equals phi of P in S2. As before, we can form the maximal ideal M sub P of O sub P inside K of S1, and similarly M sub Q of O sub Q inside K of S2. Now we'll consider the following definitions. Given any meromorphic beta from S2 to P1 of C, the composition beta composed phi from S1 to P1 of C is also a meromorphic function. So we may view the collection phi star of K of S2 which is equal to the set of beta composed with C for beta in K of S2 as a subfield of K of S1. Denote capital N as the index of phi star of K of S2 in K of X1 as the degree of phi. Choose T in M sub Q such that T is not in M sub Q squared. We call the holomorphic function T from S2 to P1 of C a uniformizer of the maximal ideal. Since T of Q equals zero, we see that the composition T composed C from S1 to P1 of C is a holomorphic function such that T composed with C of P equals zero. So denote E sub P as that integer such that T composed with C is in M sub P to the E sub P, Yet T composed with C is not in M sub P to the exponent E sub P plus one. We call E sub P the ramification index of C at P. Since S1 is compact, one shows that E sub P is always greater than or equal to one. And E sub P equals one for all but finitely many points P in S1. If E sub P is not equal to one, we say that P in S1 is called a ramification point, and that Q in S2 is called a branch point. We say that a morphism C from S1 to S2 is a branched cover if there is at least one branch point Q equals C of P. Next, we'll consider the theorem given by the Riemann Hurwitz genus formula. Fix a non constant morphism phi from S1 to S2. The degree of phi from S1 to S2 can be computed directly from the ramification indices. Choose Q in S2 and consider the pre image phi inverse of Q equals the set of P in S1 such that phi of P equals Q. We then have the formula that capital N equals the sum over P in phi inverse of Q of the ramification indices E sub P. In particular, there are only finitely many P in S1 lying above a given Q in S2. Next, we have the identity two genus of S1 minus two equals capital N times the quantity two genus of S2 minus two plus the sum over P in S1 of the quantities E sub P minus one where capital N is the degree of C. In particular, the genus G of S1 can be computed from the genus G of S2 once given a morphism C from S1 to S2. Since the E sub P's are always greater than or equal to one, 
we see that the genus of S1 is always greater than or equal to the genus of S2. One remark is that we can use this as a way to define the genus of a Riemann surface S1 if we already know the genus of S2. For example, take S2 to be P1 of C or the Riemann sphere. This has genus of S2 equals zero. On the other hand, we could take S2 to instead be the, an elliptic curve, E over C, which is isomorphic to the torus. Then in this case, the genus of S2 is one. Next, we'll look at belly maps and descend and farm. So let's suppose that the genus of S2 is zero. Then S2 equals P1 of C is the Riemann sphere. So let's consider the following definitions. A non-constant morphism beta from S1 to P1 of C whose branch points Q live in the set zero, one, and infinity is called a belly map. Denote the preimage is B equals beta inverse of zero, W equals beta inverse of one, and F equals beta inverse of infinity as marked points on the compact connected Riemann surface S1. We will define the degree sequence of beta as the multiset of multisets D, equals, first we'll give the set of E sub P's for P and B. Then we'll give the set of E sub P's for P and W. Then we'll give the set of ramification indices E sub P for P and F. Define capital N equals degree of beta as the degree of the belly map. So next we have the following proposition. Let beta from S1 to P1 of C be a belly map. The genus formula yields the following identity. Capital N is equal to the sum over P and B of E sub P. It's equal to the sum over P and W of E sub P. It's equal to the sum over P and F of E sub P. And this is equal to the size of B plus the size of W plus the size of F plus the quantity two times genus of S1 minus two. In particular, D is a collection of three partitions of capital N, where the number of parts determines the genus G of S1. So here's an example, suppose that the genus of S1 and the genus of S2 are both zero. Then S1 and S2 are both P1 of C or three bound sphere. In this case, uh, let's further consider the belly map beta of X equals X squared. Then B equals beta inverse of zero is the set zero. W equals beta inverse of one is the set plus or minus one. And F equals beta inverse of infinity is the set infinity. From these, we get that the degree sequence D is the, the multiset of multisets, where the first is the ramification index of the points in B. So in this case, the ramification index is 2. Next, the ramification indices of the points plus and minus 1 in W are one and one. And last, the ramification indices of the point infinity, uh, so its ramification index is two. So from this, we can use the formula to see that capital N is two in several ways by summing over uh, the ramification indices in each of these three sets or by taking the number, the size of B plus the size of W plus the size of F, plus twice the genus of S1, which is zero minus two. So altogether we get four minus two is two. Next we have the following proposition. So a belly map from P1 of C to P1 of C can always be expressed in the following form, either as a 
a quotient of products where the numerator has the product over the points in B and the denominator has a similar product over points in F. Or that can be written as one minus this other quotient where uh, you take a different product over points P and W divided by points P and F. Uh, OK, and so just note here the A0, B0, A1, B1 are coordinates. So P0 is A0, B0 and B, and P1 is of the form A1, B1 and W. So recall that means that beta of P0 is 0 and beta of P1 is 1. From this, we can construct a bipartite graph. So here's the definition. Suppose that we have beta from S1 to P1 of C, a belly map. Let's denote pre-images B equals beta inverse of zero, W equals beta inverse of one, and F equals beta inverse of infinity as marked points on the compact connected Riemann surface S1. We will denote the points in B as the black vertices, those in W as the white vertices, and those in F as the midpoints of the faces. We'll denote the preimages E equals beta inverse of the interval from zero to one. And we will call this set the edges. Then we'll define a the sum then font of beta as a bipartite graph with black vertices, white vertices, and edges coming from B, W, and E. <clears throat> so here, the sum then font means children's drawing. And from this, we see a bipartite graph in the following way. So we have our sets B, which is beta inverse of zero. This will correspond in our picture to black vertices. W, which was beta inverse of one, will correspond in our bipartite graph to white vertices. F, which was beta inverse of infinity, will correspond to midpoints of faces. E, which is beta inverse of the interval from zero to one, will correspond to edges. So given our belly map beta from S1 to P1 of C, we're going to embed our bipartite graph onto the surface S1. So let's see a couple pictures for S1 <coughs> of genus zero and S1 of genus one. Okay, so the claim is that this uh, beta is a belly map, and from it, uh, we're going to get the following Desson Denfa, so bipartite graph. In this picture, we have black vertices, and instead, uh, it's drawn as red vertices. And in this case, our surface S1 has genus zero, so we're drawing our bipartite graph embedded onto the surface of this sphere. Here's another picture. So given the following belly map, we'll consider now the surface S1 to be this elliptic curve E given by y squared equals x cubed plus one. So in this case, the genus of S1 is one. And so from this, uh, we can draw a Desson Denfon or a bipartite graph with black vertices, red vertices, and uh, edges that connect the black and red vertex. And here's a picture of the Desson Denfon embedded onto the surface of the torus. 